Thank you for joining us today. I am Sheila Barrett, Executive Director of Oxford's North American Office. A few housekeeping notes. This session will run for about one hour. It is being recorded and will be available to view online through our YouTube channel and the North American website. Questions that were pre-submitted have been shared with the speakers. As we received a great number of questions before the webinar, we are not taking additional questions during this talk. Today's webinar will feature Professor Gabe DeLuca, clinician scientist in clinical neurology at the University of Oxford. I'm delighted to first introduce Lady Ailish Angiolini, principal of St. Hugh's College. Lady Ailish will introduce the session and welcome Professor Gabe DeLuca, who is a fellow of St. Hugh's. Welcome, Lady Ailish. Hello to you all. It's my delight to introduce uh, today Gabriele De Luca, who is a professor of clinical neurology and experimental neuropathology. He is also an honorary consultant neurologist and director of clinical neurosciences uh, undergraduate education. Uh, and uh, he does this all at the University of Oxford. As if that wasn't enough, he has established an internationally recognized research group focused on the neuropathology of multiple sclerosis, sclerosis and other inflammatory and neurodegenerative diseases. Gabe's work uh, has resulted in numerous publications and awards, including the prestigious Kavanagh Prize, awarded by the British Neuropathological Society and Fellowship of the Royal College of Pathologists. He is the inaugural chair of Leadership University at the American Academy of Neurology and co-leads the MS Leadership Academy in the UK. He has been named an Oxford University Hospital's champion for change. And when those of you who haven't heard him before hear him today, you'll realize why. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you so much, uh, Lady Ailish, for that introduction. I'd like to also thank the North American Development Office at the University of Oxford and my colleagues uh, at Oxford in the UK for giving me this opportunity and to all of you for joining in in this webinar, which I hope you will uh, learn some important insights and contributions that Oxford has had in terms of head injury care and research. The talk today is called How Revolutionizing, revolutionizing head injury care and research is something that is truly a legacy at St. Hugh's and, and, and a really a monumental thing to celebrate as a community. So I thought I would get over the outline to give you an idea of the things that will soon follow. First, in order to understand the context, I want to introduce you to someone really foundational uh, in the development of head injury research and care in Oxford, and that is Sir Hugh Cairns. He was one of the founders of British neurosurgery, and we're gonna learn how he helped establish the Oxford Clinical School, which was important for the events that followed. And those events really concentrated around World War II and the development of the military hospital for head injuries right in the halls of St. Hugh's College. And this was really an example of innovation in the face of adversity. And then finally, the extraordinary structures that were put in place, the diligent attention to detail and longitudinal follow-up has led to an ongoing legacy in research and clinical practice. And I'd like to highlight some current studies and future work that is relevant to that basis from St. Hughes College and Oxford Neuroscience. Now, importantly, many of you have submitted questions, several exciting, all very interesting and important. Now, what I have decided to do is try to incorporate answers to some of these throughout the talk, but there'll be opportunity for you to engage with our offices afterwards, should you have additional questions in mind. So let's first start about Sir Hugh Cairns. Who was he? What was his role? And what is the significance of his contributions to head injury and research in Oxford? Well, he is a foreigner like me, not born and raised in the UK, but rather in Australia, with me not being Australian, but rather Canadian. He, similar to me and other colleagues in neurosciences, studied medicine. Now, he was attracted to the army and actually participated in World War I uh, as a part of the medical regiment there. And after uh, the war, he went to Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar at Balliol College. 
There, he read anatomy and physiology and partook in many of the traditional Oxford activities, including being on the blues boat for the, the university. And during his time in Oxford, he was exposed to extraordinary individuals, Sir William Osler being one of them, many who think is one of the founders of Western medicine, who was based at Oxford at the time, as well as others, such as uh, Sir Charles Sherrington, who was foundational in our basic understanding of the function of the brain. So in that rich academic culture, that very vibrant healthcare setting at the time, he developed an interest in surgery and in the brain. But a thing that's very important to understand is at that point in time in history, there was really not an established specialty of neurosurgery, which we take for granted today. And in fact, most times, neurosurgery or brain surgery was done by general surgeons who just did some dabbling in the brain when they had some of the time. But that was different in the US. And in fact, that prompted Sir Hugh Cairns with this interest in surgery and the brain to go over to Harvard and to spend time with Harvey Cushing on a Rockefeller traveling fellowship. And there he was exposed to really the premier techniques and research practices in neurosurgery at the time. And Harvey Cushing was an extraordinary surgeon and teacher. And in fact, it was there that Hugh Cairns importantly developed a firm dedication to surgical neurology. He understood the importance and power of having meticulous care and technical efficiency when looking at the brain. He was also subjected to ensuring that there was impeccable record keeping to follow the progress of patients around the time of surgery and importantly in the longer term. And a real highlight for Cushing um, and his, his group was to continually appraise and look at how people did around surgery. What was the mortality? What was any morbidity associated with surgical intervention, which Cairns took with him when he came back to the UK? It really highlighted to him, most importantly, that neurosurgery is best done and performed by a specialist team. So he returned to the UK in the 1920s, late 1920s, up into the mid 1930s, where he practiced in a London, in the London hospital. And at the time where neurosurgery, as I mentioned, wasn't a recognized specialty, there was initial resistance for a neurosurgical unit. And you may ask, well, why is that? Well, at the time, during this period, most of England's established senior general surgeons remained unconvinced that Cushing's delicate, overly slow and plodding techniques with gentle handling of all tissues, we're talking about the brain, and meticulous control of bleeding resulted in a better outcome. Well, through his work, his meticulous care, technical efficiency, he achieved excellent surgical outcomes. He published these results, he gave lectures, and this attracted international attention. Now, at that point, it was undisputed that having a practice of neurosurgery was clear, but how to link clinical practice with research was not. And in fact, this was a struggle at the time, mostly because of patient volume. And as you can imagine, in London, the volumes were high and opportunities to re do, do research were variable. Now, around that time, Osler, uh, before his death, made it very clear that there has to be an active invasion of the hospitals by universities, which was not the case in the UK. It was certainly coming to light in the US and Harvey Cushing and his neurosurgical practice was an exemplar of that. And Osler was impatient to have this also come to Oxford. So that really fueled uh, uh, Hugh Cairns' ambitions in Oxford. So he was in London, but thought that the clinical practice was too busy and that while in Oxford, he would have an opportunity to balance clinical practice with a research career. So he had these very intricate plans to develop high quality research and also a clinical medical school. What many don't realize is that while Oxford has a rich tradition in the medical sciences, its clinical school is rather young. Before 
the late 1930s, Oxford sent its medical students to London for clinical apprenticeship. But this would all change with uh, Hugh Cairns and his interactions with the Regis Professor of, Mes uh, of Medicine, uh, Professor Buzzard, who then agreed that they would seek benefaction and philanthropy support with Lord Nuffield being a key donor to establish a clinical medical school in Oxford. And that led to not only the clinical school, but importantly, to funded Nuffield chairs, Nuffield Chair of Medicine, Surgery, Obstetrics and Gynecology, and Anesthesia. So with now the climate of an academic powerhouse that Oxford provided, and the infrastructure to develop a clinical school, and the recognition that neurosurgery should be a separate specialty, Hugh Cairns then moved his practice and was named the first Nuffield Professor of Surgery at the University of Oxford. And this was in 1938, where he was pictured alongside his mentor, Cushing, who visited him in a celebration of this remarkable shift in practice and really galvanizing the academic fortitude of clinical medicine in Oxford. He went one step further and opened a very much specialist neurosurgical department at the Radcliffe Infirmary, and he applied all of the principles that Cushing instilled in him um, in his practice. Now, as you can imagine with the timings being in the late 1930s, there were rumors that there was uh, unrest happening in continental Europe and that war would be imminent. Now, Car Hugh Cairns and Harvey Cushing both had experience in the war, and Cushing in particular as a neurosurgeon at that time really uh, forecast how head injuries were going to be a prominent feature and they would require dedicated care. So Hugh Cairns now with a new surgical department that focused on neurosurgery in a clinical academic environment thought this is something to be ready for and to prepare for. So given his establishment in the army, this became foundational in terms of the interaction of the army, but also how one could deal with head injuries in the context of war. And so moving forward, we enter now a very dark phase in history in World War II, but yet a time of brilliant innovation with the establishment of the military hospital for head injuries, innovation in the face of adversity. So he was appointed, Hugh Cairns, uh, an advisor to the War Office on care of head injuries in the armed forces. And this was really an important step because as he was then ranked a brigadier, that really showed the importance of neurosurgery and also the confidence in Hugh Cairns to impact positive change for those who may sustain head injury. And Cairns being creative and with much foresight anticipated that there would be troubles, especially with supplies such as steel. In fact, he anticipated a steel shortage that would come in the context of war. So he, in advance, procured all of the surgical instruments that are needed for neurosurgical units that would be anticipated uh, for use in the context of head injury back in 1938. And he was appointed a lead of the military hospital for head injuries in Oxford. But why Oxford and where in Oxford would you put such a military head hospital? Well, there was recognition that given that London was going to be an area of high risk of potential raid and bombing, uh, they thought that Oxford would be relatively lower in risk, but yet have the advantage of being closer to London, such that casualties could be brought from the uh, area where there is expected to be many casualties to Oxford for prompt and efficient care. But then the question next comes, well, where in the dreaming spires and these beautiful medieval buildings in Oxford would you put a military hospital for head injuries? Well, this is where St. Hugh's played a critical role. Sir Hugh Cairns decided that St. Hugh's College would be a perfect place to transform from an academic place where women at the time were only permitted to study, that it would be a perfect place to host a military hospital for head injury. Well, why? Well, it's relatively young in Oxford standards, and it had long corridors and updated plumbing with wider room access, so that was a critical point. 
It was not far from the major hospital there in the time called the Radcliffe Infirmary. So that made interactions with other facilities uh, relatively easy. And importantly, it uh, was with uh, beautiful facilities and green spaces that allowed for expansion should the need arise. So during the context of war, imagine this. In crisis, there was innovation to think that this important space could be transformed from a place of learning to a place of ultimate clinical care innovation and research. And here you can see uh, Hugh Cairns and his team uh, assembled uh, and uh, being really the workforce that helped engineer these early innovations in the context of war. Now, there are several people that were foundational in this effort. So uh, Sir Charles Simmons was a neurologist to the uh, RAF, and Dr. George Riddick was a neurologist who was a pioneer in brain injury treatment during World War I. They were critical in working with Hugh Cairns to establish a very functional facility. But what was this facility like? Well, it was opened in 1940. Wards were built over these gardens and the buildings themselves were transformed into hospital units. Initially, it had 50 beds, but imagine by 1944, it had 430 beds and it treated over 13,000 patients 2,000 of whom had closed head injuries and 1,300 with missile injuries. So a real tour de force in terms of transformation and implementation of clinical excellence. It was a training ground. It was a training ground for people interested in surgery, neurosurgery in particular, neurology, anesthetists, medical students in this new clinical school, nurses, orderlies, and other allied health staff. There was a real culture of community, of knowledge sharing, of uh, clinical skills acquisition, of really patient-centered care. Now, what were the reflections of students at the time who were still in the orbit of the college, yet displaced in accommodations elsewhere? Some of their thoughts were really revealing about the situation then. One student says, we could, from our windows, see the Nissan huts smothering the rose beds in tennis courts and wonder whether things would ever be the same again. We would invite ambulant patients to tea or take them on the river. Another student writes, we still had use of the library. We used to walk through the grounds full of prefab wards. The patients, desperate for company, always wanted to talk to us. So, with that, a sense of community and even involvement now of students in nurturing people who suffered head injuries during the war, there were not only established uh, mechanisms to deliver high quality care, but also to undertake groundbreaking research. Now, if you recall, Hugh Cairns, when he went to the US and spent time with Harvey Cushing in Harvard, was told the importance of meticulous record keeping. Well, that never slipped in the context of war, and this was something that he insisted for each and every person admitted to the hospital, and also not only through their hospital journey, but beyond. And through that meticulous record keeping and heightened observational skills, he recognized a few fundamental things that happened that then led to research and importantly, change for the better of patient good. So essentially, he noticed that a large number of people who uh, came in with closed head injuries were military dispatch riders. Here you can see on a bike, there were several motorcyclists. And in fact, within the first 21 months of war, there were over 2,279 motorcyclists and pillion passengers killed. Now, Cairns observed very carefully of the 149 cases that he saw in the military hospital for head injuries, that 102 people died due to head injury. And most of them died because of severe injuries there rather than the other injuries with them. But the people who did survive were those who wore a helmet. So that really inspired a whole track of research looking at the role of helmets, head injury, and survival. And he was really committed to protecting these motorcyclists. And not only did he advocate for studying the epidemiology of helmet use and mortality and morbidity, 
He also worked with physicists, and namely Professor Holborn at the time, to improve helmet design such that injuries could then be further minimized. This all in the context of the war. Did it have impact? Well, certainly it did. So by 1941, imagine, shortly after the beginnings of this hospital, helmets, because of Hugh Cairn's data, were made compulsory for army motorcyclists. And if you think about this, that is a rapid change from really an observation to implementation. In times of crisis, just like we've had in COVID, you can see how the medical system, rapid alter, uh, observation and rapid implementation is uh, important in ensuring that we protect the population. This is yet another exciting example of that. So if you look at this graph, we can see here the number of monthly total motorcycle fatalities, and here on the x-axis, the years of the war. Now, A is when they uh, basically had the outbreak of the war, and B, this is when there was another spike of the monthly total motorcycle fatalities in the context of the preparations for the German invasion. Now, it's around C when the crash helmets were made compulsory. And what you can see thereafter is that there's a steady decline in the monthly total mortality of people who read uh, motorcycles. There's a little blip here at D, which was preparation for the Normandy invasion, but yet significantly less than in the pre-helmet circumstance. Now, it took, unfortunately, many years for the concept of helmets being protected for motorcyclists to actually go into law. And that's only in 1973 when helmets became compulsory for civilian motorcyclists. But the innovations didn't stop there. Importantly, and under the guidance of Harvey Cushing, Hugh Cairns was aware that in World War I, when you had a penetrating brain injury from, let's say, a missile, a gunshot wound, whatever it may be, there was up to 90% mortality. Now, Harp Cushing recognized that there are certain features that were important that could improve outcomes. And the thing that was very much in the forefront was early operation. So making sure that you access the individual as soon as possible, ideally within 24, 48 hours, remove dead tissue, get rid of bone fragments that may have entered the brain, and then close that covering of the brain called the meninges and also the scalp. These are practices that were not necessarily widely used at that time. But what happened was many survived initially after this early operative set of, of, of tasks, but many died due to infection. And this was important. So Hugh Cairns was stuck with two problems. How do we then allow early intervention and how do we prevent infection? Well, let's talk about the early intervention in the first instance. Well, Hugh Cairns thought, well, we must bring our facilities to people on the front line of the battlefield. And so he came up with the concept of a mobile neurosurgical unit, which really is the foundation of what were these mobile assessment uh, surgical hospitals that were later used in other wars, such as the Korean War and the Vietnam War. So back in 1940, he designed and put together a team that would form this mobile neurosurgical unit. And this was really meant to be an access point for the rapid treatment of head injuries. Each unit consisted of a large team that were all trained at St. Hugh's under Hugh Cairns' guidance and mentorship. There was a neurosurgeon, a triage neurologist, an anesthesiologist, there were general officers, uh, two nurse sisters, four orderlies, and two drivers. Now, importantly, it was equipped with critical supplies and infrastructure, namely an electrical generator, water supply, there were tents, two heated operating tables, and operative illumination, all within each of these mobile neurosurgical units. Now, nine were constructed, only six were used, one of which was actually uh, confiscated uh, before it could actually be used in the battlefield. Now, importantly, how did it undertake these surgeries? Well, they would align with local areas, local hospitals, or a local uh, triage areas in the battlefield where they would supply basic uh, things like laundry and radiology, but the mobile unit itself had all of the surgical instruments necessary 
uh, to undertake over 200 brain surgeries. That's quite remarkable. And to extend how innovative this was, Hugh Cairns put forward the fact that he needed to have power suction to get rid of fragments, for example, in the brain, electrocautery to help with, for example, controlling bleeding, and brain retractors, that which is to open areas to have better view of the brain that were lit, which was an innovation in and of itself at that time. Now, importantly, working in conjunction with the host hospital and also temporary cleaning stations, they were able to offer all of the basic investigations needed to ensure that they could offer the best treatment at the right time. So as I mentioned, a total of nine were built and they treated over 20,000 patients, 80% of whom had head injuries. In Italy, they had over 334 surgeries in just 16 days, which if you were to put that to any surgical trainee in 2023, that would be quite a shock. And what was remarkable with that early intervention, there was a massive reduction in mortality, down from 90% in World War I, down to about 15%. And remarkably, despite being in the midst of battle, in the front line, in a mobile surgical unit, the Cushing standard of documentation, again, never slipped. The second point that was problematic was infection. So early interventions, fine, we've got these mobile surgical units, but what about infection? Well, if one looks back in history, Fleming in 1928 discovered penicillin and its antibacterial properties. But unfortunately, he was limited in his ability to purify and concentrate it for clinical trials. This is yet another important contribution that Oxford has made, and that Howard Florey, who was another Australian who was in Oxford, a professor of pathology, uh, basically worked closely with Cairns and in his lab was able to increase the yield of penicillin. Importantly, they together were able to then work with other members at the Radcliffe Infirmary, the local hospital in Oxford at the time, but importantly, in the battlefield to study its use, to see whether or not it had any impact on infections. And the impact was outstanding. And in fact, mortality decreased even further. And overall, there was less than 10% mortality in penetrating a, a brain injury with both early intervention and now the use of penicillin that was basically refined in the context of war in Oxford on various uh, patients with different diagnoses, and certainly those with head injuries here. So imagine, in the context of war, we have the establishment of a head hospital in the Oxford College. We have the uh, documentation that having a helmet reduces mortality and importantly is then become a mandatory part of practice in the army and later in civilian life. And that early operations through a mobile surgical unit and treatment with penicillin all had massive impact. This in the setting of war. But that was still not enough for Hugh Cairns. He recognized that individuals who survived the insult of having a brain injury would often be left with several impairments, not being able to really undertake activities of their daily living, not able to go back to work, not really able to fulfill the things that they wish to do in life. So he recognized the power of rehabilitation and in fact set up two centers in around the Oxford area, one in Headington and another um, in Aylesbury to really address specifically aftercare. And for those of you um, who have ventured up into Headington, um, on the campus of Oxford Brooks University, you have Headington Hill House. And this was one of the areas where this aftercare took place, where again, exquisite documentation of patients' histories and the activities in which they engaged and their outcomes were uh, maintained. What did they do here? Well, they did practical things that would be important for returning to daily life, whether it would be using various tools or gardening or sewing or basket weaving. In addition, they would go into different uh, scenarios to do things like, for example, sawing. 
and also attention to various aspects like, for example, physiotherapy and helping with things like gait. But there was further innovation. Helping these patients meant that they had to have a whole variety of healthcare workers follow them and make sure that they could assist them in a way that was safe. And here we see the invention of the Oxford Lift. So all of these were meant to be a patient-centered way of comprehensive clinical care, breaking down the silo of neurology, neurosurgery, and other healthcare specialties with rehabilitation to ensure that the evolving needs of a patient are met. So not just doing research to pave a pathway for a cure now, but also importantly, to minimize suffering for these individuals and to allow them to have uh, a maximal performance and potential in their daily lives. And so when we reflect back then after the conclusion of the war, there was still a need to follow these patients for Hugh Cairns. He wanted to see not only their outcomes at the time of the hospital admission, at the time of aftercare in these rehab facilities, but importantly, what are the long-term outcomes of having a brain injury on how people are 10, 20, 50 years down the road? And so what happened was he assembled a team that continued with various neurologists, psychiatrists, rehab experts, but also a really important neuropsychologist, Frida Newcomb, who followed these patients and many, over 2,000 of these patients were followed for decades with meticulous documentation of how they did over time. And these patients were delighted to come back. It was again, an extended community for them to come while engaging in research. A subset of these uh, patients under uh, Frida's watch had detailed neuropsychology. And one of our fellows at St. Hughes, Edward Dahan, has also was also a participant where he did his DFL in Oxford in the 1980s and contributed to this data collection. Remarkably, 80 of these patients went on to have later radiology, which we have in hand. And something very special in what I do, which as a clinical neurologist, I have a laboratory looking at people who have donated their brains after death for research. 22 of these soldiers who had penetrating wounds to their brain and survived decades donated their brain for ongoing research. Now, lots of data on how people did in terms of their cognition, lots of data about whether or not they had epilepsy, lots of data about their ability to engage in various uh, motor tasks were uh, accumulated over time. And one person in the audience had asked the question, well, what was the rate of epilepsy in the cohort of individuals who sustained head injury during the war? Um, and that were followed. And I can report that there were about 427 out of a thousand of those who had penetrating headshot, again, uh, gunshot wounds to the brain. That's about 39% of these individuals actually went on to have uh, uh, epilepsy of some sort with various seizures throughout their life course. Very important. And now we're exploring in detail all of these records which are well-preserved and they have been cataloged and curated in St. Hughes College where there's an, an archive that is now really a rich resource for research. And one of my DFL students, Dr. Jonathan Atwood is working with myself and Edward DeHaan to really capitalize the importance and value of this rich resource. And Lady Eilish has been monumental in promoting the excellence of neuroscience and supporting us to engage in these activities. And we're very grateful to her and her leadership. So the question is, well, what is it that we do? What is the ongoing legacy in research and clinical practice? What is happening? What is the type of data that we have? And how is that gonna really inspire future work? Well, let me take the remaining part of the talk to explore how this rich history at St. Hughes has led to something completely foundational that is now a social responsibility, a healthcare responsibility to really explore all of this fascinating data and then undertake cutting edge research to make a palpable difference for the better in people who suffer from brain diseases. But let me do this through telling you a story of someone who was 
in the military hospital for head injuries after having a sustained a gunshot wound. I present to you a 20 year old man who at the time of injury had two years of military service. In October 24th, 1944, he sustained a penetrating gunshot wound to the left side of his head. With the mobile surgical unit, he had surgery on the same day in the field. A few days after, he de developed a seizure affecting the right side of his body. In fact, he had two of those. On November 1st, just days later, he was evacuated to the UK, where he was transferred to the military hospital for head injuries. There, he was given penicillin and some anti-seizure medicines. On the 3rd of November, he had an x-ray of the skull. And what you can see here that is highlighting in that uh, red circle is an X. And beside that is FB, standing for foreign body. There was a metal foreign body that was located at the base of the right skull. And despite surgical exploration on the left side, they couldn't find it. They saw it on the right side and they didn't do much more because they couldn't access it. Now, he continued under the care at the time. And by the end of November, he was described as being up and about all day, only a slight limp on walking. The history and evaluation continues. In December 11, 1944, he had a neuropsychology evaluation. And here, Major Renell, a psychiatrist, writes, this boy, whose pre-traumatic intelligence was below average, is now unable to write or to repeat more than three digits backwards. His hemiplegia, or weakness on one side, is clearing up, but he still has neglective vision on one side or an inability to see on one side, which doubtless affects his test scores. There is evidence of intellectual loss, but assessment is difficult owing to low IQ. Now, this is an important text because it tells us about language at the time that we wouldn't use today, but importantly, it gives you an idea of the detailed rigor of assessment that was engaged with each of the people who were in this military hospital. The evaluation continued even when they left with periodic follow-ups. And in May, 1945, this chap returned to work and was repairing motor vehicles. If we look at the date, this person engaged in serial follow-up. And in fact, we look 20 years later, has detailed neurology, neuropsychological evaluation, where here written by the assessor, the present disability is extremely slight. I cannot find a visual defect when I examine. There is very minimal weakness on the right side of the leg more so than arm. And there's remarkable preservation of fine finger movements. They also had a little bit of loss on the right side that you can see that's documented here. But this was done in a way that was actually in punch cards where things could be objectively quantified so that there was something comparable between people. So there was free text, but also quantitative scores in these punch cards, of which we have many thousands that um, represent the follow-up points for these patients. This is uh, another excerpt from the file where the patient was asked to uh, copy a cube or a star, and you can see how well um, he has done 20 years after the injury. Now, if that weren't enough, this patient remained dedicated to the research cause, continued to follow up, but very powerfully, I had the extreme fortune of meeting this patient, a patient treated by Hugh Cairns and his team during World War II. I, as an academic at the University of Oxford, met them, but not in a way that we traditionally would meet someone, but in the context in this setting of my research. And in fact, in 2012, this patient died of natural causes and did not have dementia, importantly, despite having had that brain injury, and donated their brain to the Oxford Brain Bank, where I, as a professor, was there to receive it, to undertake research. So I'm going to now show you some uh, pictures of this brain. Um, these are after the blood has been removed, okay? They are structural pictures of the brain. So if you do uh, wish not to look, I uh, ask you to turn away from your screen or blacken your screen, but there's nothing here um, that um, hopefully 
will um, be offensive to you, but that's a warning uh, with regards to now seeing a postmortem brain, okay? So the brain came to our brain bank, and what you can see here is two pictures. One here on the left-hand side is a view from above. And imagine this here where my dot is, is the front of the brain, and this here is behind. So where the arrow is pointing is the left side of that person's brain. And you can see how the protective covering here, the meninges, is disrupted, and the brain material is also uh, dysmorphic, okay? Uh, has a change in appearance because of the penetrating gunshot wound. Now, when we flip the brain upside down and we look, so this is now the view from below, we don't really see any obvious abnormalities uh, on a macroscopic view. So I wanted to understand better what this brain actually looked like by getting some neuroimaging. Now, I initially wanted to get an MRI scan, but I was told that it would probably be best to get a CT scan to make sure there weren't any metallic fragments that would then ruin the MRI scanner. And I'm glad that I did. So we took the brain and we put the brain in a CT scanner. And again, this is the view from above. And we developed a 3D reconstruction of the brain itself. Well, long and behold, we were stunned. We were stunned to see that on the bottom part of the right side of the brain, there was a metallic object that looked the shape and size of a bullet. And this is the area that corresponded very much with that, which you can see here on that X-ray that was obtained in 1944. Now, at the time, we didn't have access to that X-ray, but fortunately, the CT scan illuminated its presence. So in the neuropathology laboratory at the Oxford Brain Bank, I then flipped the brain upside down, knowing that it was on the right side and not the left where it entered. And at the bottom of the brain, not at the top, I felt this indurated area. And then with a scalpel, I was able to retrieve a fully intact bullet. Here you can see it's encased. And then that with that removed, a bullet that was sustained more than 70 years before. Quite remarkable. So then we could do an MRI scan. And so with the metal removed, we took the brain and put it inside an MRI scanner with our exceptional neuroimaging unit, the Welcome uh, a center for Integrated Neuroimaging, uh, led by one of my colleagues, Heidi Johansenberg. And with Carla Miller and her team, Sean Foxley, we imaged this postmortem brain. And what you see here is a different view. This is imagining that the patient would be facing you. And this is the left side, and this is the right side. So imagine you're looking at someone, this is the left side, and this is the right side. And where you can see here is disrupted tissue where the bullet entered, it remarkably entered the left side of the brain and actually crossed and went all the way to the bottom of the right side of the brain where it rested until its removal in 2012. So a remarkable uh, uh, feat to have survived this. And in fact, this structure here is called the hippocampus, which is vital for memory. And as you can see, it appears intact. So we have now basically a brain that has these disrupted connections between structures from below and above. But this is not the only one. We have, in addition to this patient, we have incredibly 21 other people who sustained penetrating gunshot wounds and survived for decades with serial neurology, psychiatry, neuropsychology, that donated their brains for research. So these patients cared for by Sir Hugh Cairns and his team, followed regularly with neuropsychological testing, with 22 of them being super dedicated and were very grateful for themselves and their families uh, for the donation of their brains for research to the Oxford Brain Bank. Now, my PhD student, Jonathan Outwood, along with colleagues at the Imaging Center, reconstructed what these brains and the different um, trajectories actually look like if we look them in practice. I'm going to try to play this for you. 
um, if I may, and I'm not sure if I can, depending on whether or not my pointer now allows me. Um, well, it's not playing here, unfortunately. Well, I'll move on. But we have reconstructed, as you can see here, with different colors, the trajectories of the various gunshot wounds and how they impacted the brain with each color representing a different individual with regards to their uh, gunshot wound and the damage that happened to the brain. Quite remarkable, in fact. Oh, and here you see it. So in fact, what you can see here is each of these colors representing the trajectory of the gunshots for different patients that we now have in house in Oxford Brain Bank. So how can this be used for research? What are the questions that we're asking? One that I posed today that addresses some of the other questions that were posed in the pre-session chat. Can the study of penetrating gunshot wounds to the brain from World War II provide clues about mechanisms that are relevant to Alzheimer's disease? Well, Alzheimer's disease is a devastating neurological condition that results in increasing impairment in people's ability to, to think their cognitive aspects in many domains are impacted, and that leads to redu reduced quality of life. Now, we do know that there are specific proteins that accumulate in the brain over time, and in particular, it's stage dependent. So as someone gets worse in terms of their cognition, we know that they have an accumulation of these different proteins in a stage dependent way. That's true for one protein called amyloid, but certainly for another one called tau. So how does this actually evolve? So when we look at the different stages and we look particularly of this protein called tau, initially it accumulates in the middle parts of the brain as I'm circling here, in the mesial temporal uh, cortical areas. And at this point, when there's uh, accumulation that's demarcated here in brown, people may be cognitively normal. But as that accumulates and starts to affect increasing areas around it, people start developing increasing symptoms, going from what may be changes related to aging to then mild cognitive impairment. And then as this pathology, this tau spreads further throughout the, the brain in stage uh, five to six, you can see that as it becomes more widespread, that then uh, correlates with much more moderate to severe dementia. So looking at this kind of march, it seems that there's a spread from one nerve cell to the next, starting from the middle and going to other parts of the brain. So that's led to people hypothesizing. Now this is a nerve cell and these are different parts of that abnormal protein called tau. Well, the theory is, is that these proteins basically uh, get transmitted from one nerve cell to the next where they're uptake, uptaken and then basically transmitted to the next adjoining cell, leading to a propagation of tau throughout the brain and resulting in worsening cognitive deficits. Well, this has been shown in some animal studies and also in uh, models where we can look under the Petri dish, but there hasn't really been a human system to demonstrate that. Well, that is until now with this exceptional World War II cohort, where we have now severed the connections from this area, which is in the mesial temporal area, which is affected by tau early on, we can see whether or not, if there's a gunshot wound that basically separates the connections of one area of the brain from an area distant to it, whether or not that also has the impact of halting the spread of tau from the middle of the brain to other parts of the brain. Now, this particular case is unusual in that both sides of the brain were affected by the gunshot wound. Fortunately, most of our patients only had one side of the brain affected. So if that's the case, then we can use the one side of the brain that has the severed connections to see whether or not whether or not the pathways that link them that are severed lead to a change in how that tau protein propagates. And we can compare it to the other side of the brain, which doesn't have the connection severed, to control for factors such as their age um, and also their duration of any symptoms that they may or may not have had. 
So this is one example where my PhD student, uh, Jonathan Atwood, is engaging with our team to really understand some of the fundamental biology, but that only possible by really having access to these brains, but also the clinical records of the thousands of soldiers that um, uh, from which these brains came. Importantly, we also have uh, additional research that's being undertaken in terms of the long-term outcomes of soldiers who sustained uh, penetrating gunshot wound or other penetrating brain injury with those who had a closed head injury where there wasn't any penetration of the brain and seeing how they did after decades to look to see what their causes of death are, what their different morbidity is, to really understand better the evolution in the longer term. And that forms part of the, the research that we're doing that hopefully I will be able to provide an update uh, to you in the not so distant future. But the legacy that Hugh Cairns has left must continue, not just in terms of the data that he collected, the clinical practice that he innovated, it's linked to research. We have an obligation to continue understanding brain diseases. And Oxford Neurosciences is very much on the mission to really battle these important questions so that we can improve patients' lives, so that we can reduce suffering, and hopefully one day pave a pathway for a cure. Some examples of this include a tradition of neuropathology that remains. My mentor, Margaret Aziri, worked with people who had direct links with Hugh Cairns, and she instilled in me a passion of the power of brain banking. So while patients who are alive, we want to give the best care, understanding what happens to the brains after death is really important because then we can understand what happens at the molecular level that can really help us understand fundamental aspects of the disease that we hope one day can help treat people during life to prevent the accumulation of disability. Now, one thing that we've established here in partnership with the Concussion Legacy Foundation is the Concussion Legacy Project. This is a partnership between Oxford University and the Concussion Legacy Foundation to establish a UK-wide brain bank for elite athletes and veterans who have repetitive head injury. As you will have heard, no doubt, in recent years, head impact, repetitive head impact in sport, in combat, whether it be at war or otherwise, for people who have suffered domestic violence, et cetera, does have deleterious impacts on people's mental health but also their cognition and other bodily functions. But our understanding of this needs to improve. Foundational to understanding have been groups in the UK, but also elsewhere, with the Concussion Legacy Foundation partnering with Anne McKee and her team in Boston University, where they uh, defined an entity in uh, NFL players, National Football League players, who play American football, where with increased exposure to concussion, increased duration of, uh, of play, they had signatures uh, that resemble what we call chronic traumatic encephalopathy, a pathological signature related to uh, this participation that um, was associated with uh, mental health issues, but also cognitive impairment. Now that has been demonstrated in American football, um, also in boxers, it's been uh, demonstrated in other sports. And here in the UK, we have a different set of sports that are common, like for example, uh, soccer or uh, football as we call it in this part of the world in the UK. So we are really trying to understand and broaden the spectrum of people who've had repetitive head injury to see what the range of pathology is and how it relates to people's experiences during life. And really the ambition is to go even one step further. Brain donation is one bit and understanding the brain afterlife is relevant, but we really wanna revolutionize how people are cared for and how they can participate in research while they're alive to pave a pathway to prevention and cure. Just to give you in the last moments an idea of where this is going, right now, given the structures of the NHS and how we um, have developed our systems over time, um, when we see patients who have acute neurological problems, um, Oxford is like many other places in the UK and elsewhere in the world. You get your acute neurological care in a hospital, like for example, in Oxford, the John Ratcliffe Hospital. 
And this is an example of someone who has, for example, multiple sclerosis, but this applies to someone who's had repetitive head injury, for example, where they may come at the age, let's say, of 24, having been well, at the age of 26, having come with uh, an episode, whether it be a concussion or whether it be due to an inflammatory relapse that we see in multiple sclerosis, they come to us, they see a neurologist, for example, and I decide that they may need to have a referral to a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a speech and language pathologist. Well, that typically happens in another site, and that may require up to 16 different referrals for them to get comprehensive care. Now, unfortunately, if, however, their disease advances, and as a neurologist, we feel that they require more rehabilitation than neurological intervention, then we discharge them and we send them to a rehabilitation hospital for long-term care. And in Oxford, that happens in a place like the Oxford Center for Enablement, but it also it goes that they then get discharged to the community for ongoing care. Well, the issue is, is that that's fragmented and the patient then has a different experience at different disease stages. And importantly, it's not really an efficient way to engage in patient-centered care nor enable in a, uh, fostering an ability to undertaking groundbreaking research that requires longitudinal follow-up over time, as did Harvey Cushing and Hugh Cairns in Oxford. Now, another question is, well, do we have links with the U.S.? And unfortunately, we do. And in fact, I, as faculty, visited um, an institution in Connecticut called Quinnipiac University and a comprehensive MS center called the Mendel Center, which was extraordinary because they, within a rehab hospital, have their neurological services embedded within it for a one-stop shop. And this is a model that has not only allowed a patient-centered experience, but also excellence in developing high-quality data over time. And this is what we would like to bring to Oxford. We want to break down these barriers and create purpose-built spaces where neurology, psychiatry, and rehabilitation unite to transform clinical care and discovery neuroscience for the benefit of patients. And this is something we're working with our development office to get an infusion of funding support to make this dream a reality. Because the vision is until no one suffers from brain disease and our mission is to enhance performance, improve quality of life, and cure people with brain diseases through revolutionizing patient care and engaging in transformative discovery neuroscience. And with that, we start off with a remarkable history of the World War II head injury hospital uh, led by Hugh Cairns to where we are today, with many themes being the same, patient-centered care, cutting-edge research, and importantly, bringing that together with world-class education. Here's the departmental website at the University for Clinical Neurosciences, should you wish to look at the amazing research done by our group and my amazing colleagues. Um, and importantly, I would like to thank key people, whether it be in the Academic Unit of Neuropathology, the Imaging Center, the college, with special thanks to Lady Elish for her support, um, people that were foundational in the military hospital, the Department of Neurosurgery, the Center for Prevention of Stroke and Dementia, and the Concussion Legacy Foundation. But last, but certainly not least, I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor DeLuca and Lady Ailish for your time today and your brilliant research on revolutionizing head injury care and research. So you will soon see a slide with ways to keep in touch with Oxford's North American office. Please make sure that your contact information is up to date um, as email is really the best way for us to reach out to you and let you know about future events. Until then, thank you. <laughs>